ever feel like I sound like a broken record? I feel like I say good morning like eight times a day on Sunday mornings. Is it just me? But maybe, yeah, maybe I should just start saying good afternoon or good evening or, you know, something different. I, uh, this morning we're, we're closing out the series we've been doing. And uh, this one is honestly, <laughs> this one has been kind of an interesting one for me. Um, because it's really not something we talk a lot about. You know, we, we talk about, you know, we're sinners. We're sinners saved by grace. Jesus died on the cross for us. Accept the gift and move on. But we really don't spend a lot of time in churches talking about what that means. And we don't, it, we don't really do a good job as far as saying that, yes, if this happened and you, you accept Jesus as your Savior and you fall flat on your face, that's not the end of the road. We don't talk a lot about it. We don't look at it and say, well, yeah, that's easy for you to say, but nobody else experienced what I experienced. And so this has been kind of a different series for us because we've gone back and we've actually looked at people who we see in the, script, in, in the Bible and Scripture that in a lot of ways were no different than us. And so we started off the first week by, by looking um, at King David. You know, David was, was listed as a man after God's own heart. And so we look at his story and we see him having an affair with a woman named Bathsheba and, and, and having a child with her uh, outside of marriage and moving from there going into to making plans to have her husband Uriah basically murdered by sending him to the very front lines of the war they were fighting and ordering the rest of the troops to fall back. Um, but then we see, well, if that's it, how in the world could he be a man after God's own heart when he did those things? Because we all know those things are just absolutely horrible. Um, but he was restored, and, and he was called a man after God's own heart because he always repented. Anytime he was, he was confronted with something he did, he always asked for forgiveness. And we talk about repentance, and it's this big word that basically means I was walking this way, and then I made a decision to stop walking that way and start walking this way. And so we see this happen with, with King David. He, he repents every time he's confronted with something that he did, and, and he always confesses. He always says, okay, God, I really messed this up this time. I'm so sorry. Can we start over again? He chased after God, so much so that in the book of Psalms, he actually writes these words. He says, I've hidden your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. He went from being this person who was an adulterer and a murderer to being this person who said, I don't want to do that anymore, so I'm hiding your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. And then in the second week, we looked at Job, and we know Job's story. Job was a prominent man who, who had literally everything you could possibly wish for, and it ended up being stripped away from him, and he had nothing left. And in the middle of all of those things, he never cursed God. He never gave up, but he did wish that he had never been born. He hated his circumstances so much that he said, if I had never been born, this would have never happened. But he never once cursed God. He stuck it out. He stuck with it. He remained faithful even in the hard times and ended up being restored to twice what he was before. And we looked and we walked away by saying the same, this idea that caterpillars always struggle before becoming butterflies. They always have to go through something hard before they come out as the beautiful things that we see flying all over the place going from here and there. And then the next week we looked at a man named John Mark who's literally just kind of a blip on the radar of the Bible. John Mark was um, part of a missionary trio with, with Paul, and Barna, uh, yeah, Paul and Barnabas who went all over the place trying to plant churches and start churches. And at some point, he completely deserted them. He abandoned them on their, on their journey. And eventually it comes back where Barnabas says, you know, I think we should go here and let's take, let's take John Mark with us. And Paul says, no. He left us. He deserted us. He doesn't deserve anything that we have to offer. But at some point, there was a conversation that happened where John Mark came face to face with the consequences of what he had done. And there was a conversation that happened, and his, the relationship there was restored between he and Paul. And eventually he became one of Paul's most trusted workers. He became the person who Paul found comfort in when they were in the middle of the toughest times. And we walked away from that by saying, falling away, making those mistakes, walking away from what you believe for just a brief period of time, because we don't know what happened. We don't know what made John Mark walk away. But falling away doesn't mean that you shouldn't come back. It doesn't mean that you're stuck there and you can't, that you shouldn't come all the way back. Last week, we took a look at somebody that was completely different than any of us, most likely. It was a man in a region called the Gerasenes. Jesus steps off of the boat that he's in um, on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, and this, this demon-possessed man runs to him from the tombs. And he stops, and he meets him there, and there's a confrontation there. 
and, and Jesus has this conversation with him. And in this moment, we talked about the idea that we are in a spiritual war everywhere we go. We're not fighting against people. We're not, we're not fighting a war that, in, that results in bloodshed, but it's a war that happens in places that we can't see between spiritual beings that are fighting over our souls. And in this particular instance, this man had lost the battle. He was completely overrun by his desires, by everything that he had probably been fighting against forever. But Jesus steps foot into the battlefield of this man's life. He came to the place where the man was, not where he wanted the man to be. He met him where he was in the middle of the worst part of his life and restored him and redeemed him. And we walked away by saying that you will never be too far for God to meet you on the battlefield. This is something over the course of this entire series. If nothing else, that one, that one statement from last week should be one of the most encouraging things that you ever hear. That you will never be too far as long as your heart is beating for God to restore you and to make you and bring you back to that place where he desires for us to be from the very beginning of time. But here's the problem with that. For years, the 25 plus years that I've been in ministry and the 20 plus years that Raquel and I have been married, from the time I was 12, 13, even younger than that, I have watched people who have done this exact same thing. They get to that place where they realize something has got to give. I can't win this battle. I am fighting as hard as I can. I can't get past this. I can't move past it. I've been in that position myself. I've struggled with things that I have found myself laying awake at night going, God, how am I? I can't get past this. I cannot get over this. I don't deserve it. I don't do anything. We get to that place where we realize that we need Jesus to step into the battle and fight for us, but we just can't let go of it. We just can't let go. We cannot take our hands off of the fight long enough for him to jump in and actually fight the battle for us. Or maybe we've been fighting the battle ourselves and we've lost and we've made all the mistakes in the world we possibly can. And we reach that place and we go, I can't, I just can't let go of it. I've done too much. I cannot let go of the life that I'm living now to let Jesus take over. I just can't do it. And the reason why, there's two main reasons why that happens. The first one is, is because somewhere deep inside of us, we believe that we deserve everything that we've gotten as a result of our actions. Inside of us, there is something in us that says, I deserve exactly what I've gotten. In fact, we see the same exact thing happen to the thief on the cross. When, he is, when Jesus is on the cross, the two thieves are there. One of the thieves is absolutely berating Jesus, saying, if you truly are the Son of God, then save yourself and save us. The other thief looks at him and says, dude, have you absolutely no idea what you're doing? You, have you no shame? We're getting what we, what? Deserve. We deserve what we're getting. We deserve to be separated from God. We deserve death. Him, he has done nothing to deserve this. It is inside of us to feel like we deserve what we're getting. When we find ourselves at the very bottom of the barrel, we believe that we deserve it. The other thing that's true about us is even if we may not believe that we deserve it, we believe that we don't deserve for God to step in and fight the battle for us. Every single person that has ever lived has fallen into one of those two categories. You either believe that you're getting what you deserve, or you believe that you don't deserve for Jesus to step in and pull you out of the situation that you're in. And usually it's because we feel like we have done something so absolutely horrible. We struggle with this because it's so unbelievable. It is so unbelievable for us to believe that the God that created everything would step into our little insignificant life, that he would care enough about us to do something for us, to restore us. It's so unbelievable that we pull away from it, we shy away. Our mind immediately goes to, I don't deserve it, or that's way too much. This one thing, that thing right there, it's too much, is a fundamental flaw in human nature. Because we don't understand God. We don't understand how somebody can give something extravagant to somebody who doesn't deserve it. 
There's a, there's a, a, a guy on, on social media that, that my family has gotten really pretty fond of. Um, we, we've watched several of his videos. Um, and and he, it blows my mind to see some of the things that he does. He is honestly, I have no idea whether he's a believer. Don't know if he's a Christian. Don't know if he's not. All I know is he is one of the most generous people I've ever laid eyes on. Uh, the bulk of the videos that he does, he's randomly giving out $10,000 here, $10,000 here, $100,000 here, half a million dollars here, a private island here, a Lamborghini here, a Ferrari there, cars here, cars there, cars whatever. And every single reaction that, he, that you see from the people who he just randomly pops up and does it for is like, wait, are you kidding me? Really? You're, no. You're not really just going to give me $10,000. You're, you're really not just going to give me, a, you're giving me this car. What's the catch? That's our mindset. Our mindset is, is that we don't deserve the extravagant things. We don't deserve the things that may possibly be an inconvenience for somebody. When we mess up and somebody shows up on our doorstep saying, man, I love you. How can I help you? We immediately push back. I don't deserve it. I've made too many mistakes. I've hurt too many people. I don't deserve it. But this one thing is one of those things that we look at it and say, well, they're just being humble. They're just being humble. Uh, humility is great. Humility is great. Whenever we look at somebody and, and we say, you know what, I just, I just don't deserve. I don't deserve for God to get in my life. So, oh, they're just being so humble. They're being so gracious and they're just opening. And no. Humility is a good thing. Humility is one of those things that grounds us because we begin to see when we understand who we are. That's what humility is. Humility is having a, a healthy understanding of who we are in relationship to God. That's what humility is. False humility, which is what most of us tend to execute in our lives, is damaging. True humility is one of those things that can bridge a gap between us and God because we understand who he is, but false humility damages the relationship because we're still saying, oh, I, I'm, I'm not worthy. And the whole time God's going, yeah, but you believe you are. Because the reality is this, is that even though we're saying I'm not worthy, God sees our hearts and he understands what's going on. People around you will look at you. And, there, and this is the thing that we have to understand. People know whether or not you are truly humble or not. People know whether you're truly humble or you're just saying that you want to be able to do those things that, uh, that, that make us look humble so that we can have this air of, of holiness and godliness about us. But God is not fooled. We have to remember that where we are in our lives, okay, if you're one of those people that truly says, you know what, I just I don't deserve it. I don't deserve for God to restore me. I don't deserve any of this. You are actually in a good place. You are in a good place. If you are the kind of person who says, you know what, I have done this to myself and I really don't deserve for God to do this. You are in a great starting point because you're right, you don't deserve it. None of us do. None of us deserve for God to step into our world to make anything better for us. None of us deserves for God to step out of heaven, for Jesus to step from God's throne room onto our earth to fight our battles for us. None of us deserve it. But the reason that he does it is because he wants us to understand that where we are right now, whether you are in a position where you have blown through every bit of money you have and you're about to lose your house, regardless of what your marriage looks like, regardless of what the relationships around you look like, regardless of what your work situation looks like, regardless of whether or not you haven't eaten anything in a week, regardless of whatever that is, that place doesn't have to define you. You don't have to stay in that place. That's the entire reason why God stepped out of heaven, because God is not bound by our current location. God is not bound by our current situations. He's not bound by our past situations. He's not bound by any of that. In fact, the Bible teaches us that God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere, and he is omniscient. He sees everything. From the very beginning of time, he knew 
He knew where we would end up. He knew, and this is one of those things that just blows everybody's mind, so don't try to wrap your head around it right now. God was able to be present in the beginning and be present at the end and be present right in the middle of where you are right now all at the same time. He knew when, before he ever created Adam and Eve, he knew that as soon as he created them, the serpent would enter the garden and would tempt Eve and would, allow, would end up prevent, moving to this place where a man was separated from God. He knew it was going to happen. So from the very, very beginning of the Bible, the very beginning of that whole thing, the entire first book of the Bible begins to tell the story of God starting to unravel his plan to be able to restore you and to restore me back to what he originally intended for us to be. So wait a minute, what do you mean? In the very beginning, God chose a man named Abraham. At the time, his name was Abram, but he chose him to become the father of a mighty nation, a nation that would end up becoming the Jews. The, that same group of people, that nation would become the lineage that would produce the Messiah. Okay? This means, yes. That whole lineage begins to fall into place and begins to, be, begin to move into this amazing scenario where we begin to see everything unfold. Right around 1700 B.C. or so, a young man is born um, into a family, a very large family of brothers that absolutely hated him because his father showed so much favoritism towards him. He ended up being sold into slavery, ends up finding himself in, in Egypt, ends up being imprisoned, and then ends up becoming Pharaoh's number two guy. Okay, Roughly... A hundred years after his birth, roughly 1600 B.C., at this point, Joseph has passed away. Joseph, during the whole time he was there, he became Pharaoh's number two. A famine hits the land. The entire, his entire clan moves in to Egypt. And around 1600 B.C., we've seen, we see this massive population boom happen, so much so that the Pharaoh becomes uneasy over what's happening because he's thinking, these guys, there's so many of these Israelites now. There's so many of these people that they're going to cause an issue for us. So he enslaves them and he pushes them so unbelievably hard. He pushes them to a breaking point. During this time, during this population boom, there's a man, a young man, a, a baby born whose name is Moses. Moses becomes the adopted grandson of Pharaoh. For 40 years, Moses lives in Pharaoh's court. For 40 years, Moses grows into an adult. And then roughly 1550 B.C., Moses is a grown man. And Moses makes a decision that will change his life forever. In Exodus chapter 2, starting in verse 11, we see this. It says, One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. Okay, He's talking about his people here. This is not talking about the Egyptians. At this point, he knows he's a Hebrew. He knows where he comes from. He knows his history. He knows his heritage. Because his mother, his birth mother, had actually been brought in to serve as a wet nurse for him. So she's, as, uh, the whole time he's been learning Egyptian culture, his mother's actually also been teaching him about who he is. So this whole time, she, she, he sees the, his people and he sees the burdens there. And it says he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. Okay? Again, Moses knows who the Hebrews are. He knows that he's one of them, that he's different. It says, he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. He kills him. He goes to the fence of the, of the Hebrews. He kills the Egyptian. He buries him in the sand. It says, he went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. They were fighting with each other. And he said to the man in the wrong, why are you striking your companion? He said, why are you doing this? The one who was in the wrong, he calls him out and says, why are you attacking your fellow Hebrew? Why are you attacking one of your own? And he answers him and says, who made you prince and judge over us? Are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? This is one of those moments where if you've ever been caught in something, you know what this would have felt like. If you've ever done something that you shouldn't have done and you knew you shouldn't have done it and somebody brings it back to the surface, you know this, the pit in your stomach that pops up. You know what this feels like. Moses immediately recognizes, then Moses was afraid and thought, surely this thing is known. 
He's thinking to himself, surely everybody knows what I did yesterday. Everybody knows that I killed this guy. Everybody knows what happened. And he says, when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But, Pharaoh, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. Moses did something he knew he shouldn't have done. Moses knew that he was doing something that was going to end up getting him in trouble. This moment starts the 40-year self-imposed exile of Moses. This starts a time period where most of us, I mean, you spend your, I'm 43 years old, okay? I look back on my life and I see 40 plus years. I can't imagine running and being gone from the people that I love for 40 years, from my family for 40 years without having inter, any interaction. But the reality is, is we all know what this feels like. We all know what it feels like to go into this place because when we do something that we think is unforgivable, we exile ourselves. When we do something that we feel like nobody will understand or we do something that we know, man, I really should not have done that. I have really, really messed up. We exile ourselves. We, we begin to isolate ourselves. We leave our friends and we leave all of our other loved ones behind and we find ourselves changing who we are and what we believe. So I, where do you get that from? Well, when Moses goes into the land of Midian, the Midianites had a completely different religious background than the Israelites and the Hebrews. They, they had a completely different system of beliefs. Moses ends up marrying the daughter of the chief. The chief of the tribe of Midian, Jethro. He becomes part of Jethro's family. He had to have absorbed so much over the course of time. Forty years he is there. For 40 years he runs from his sin. For 40 years he tries to hide from his sin. He exiles himself so that he doesn't have to deal with it. And then something completely even more unbelievable to us than the thought of God stepping into our world happens. One day he's out keeping the sheep and he walks by and he happens to catch out of the corner of, an eye, of his eye a bush that is on fire. But the bush isn't burning up. It's just sitting there burning. And he looks at it and he goes, what in the world? So the Bible says he walks over to investigate to see what's going on. And as soon as he gets close, the Bible says that a voice comes from the bush and says, Moses, take off your sandals because the ground you're standing on is holy ground. And Moses immediately falls to his face and he realizes something is happening. But he falls on his face because even with as far as he has gone from his history and from the things that he grew up with and in his, his heritage and his legacy and all that stuff, he knows that he is in the presence of something unbelievable because he still has inside of him this knowledge that even though I am this, I, I, I messed up, there is something happening here that I have got to pay attention to. We all know that feeling. This is the moment in our lives where we look at our past and we say, I've done so much, and God is saying, just hand it over to me. Let me take it. Let me restore you. Let me use you. And we say, but I've done there's a conversation that opens up right here between God and Moses. God basically says, okay, Moses, I'm going to send you to do the thing. I'm going to send you back so that you can tell Pharaoh to get my people and let them go. Moses basically says, but, but, but who am I? I'm just a failure. All I've done is mess up. God says, okay, that's fine. I'm going to go with you. I will be with you. Moses says, but what if they want to know who told me to go? God says, okay, fine. Tell them my name is I am. Moses says, but... And God says, okay, fine. Here, let me prove to you a few things. And he tells Moses, he says, what is that in your hand? He says, well, it's a staff. He says, okay, throw it down. So he throws it down and it turns into a snake and Moses probably freaks out a little bit because if I threw a stick down and it turned out to be a snake, I'd freak out too. And he says, okay, Moses, now pick it up. And Moses probably looked at it and said, 
foot, it's a snake. And God probably said, just pick it up. So Moses probably very tentatively reached over, grabbed it, picked it up, and it turns back into a, into a staff. God says, okay, put your hand into your cloak and pull it out. Sticks his hand in the cloak, pulls it out, it's covered with leprosy. Which probably would have made Moses freak out again. He says, okay, put it back in and pull it back out. He sticks it in, pulls it back out, and his hand is clean. Moses begins to realize, he says, okay, there's something going on. God, yeah, okay, yeah, you're good. I see what you're doing here. You almost got me, but I don't talk so good. We know that Moses had some sort of speech impediment, whether it was a stutter or whether it was just he had a hard time formulating what he wanted to say. God says, don't worry about it. I'll give you the words to speak. Moses says, but, and God says, okay, fine. Scripture says that at this point, God is angry with him. He says, fine, Moses, I will send somebody to speak for you, but I am sending you to do this. Moses says, okay, fine. God says, if it'll make it easier for you, Moses, you've been gone so long, the consequences you were worried about gone. The people who wanted you dead, they're dead. It's time to go back because I have something for you to do. Moses is every single one of us. So I've never killed anybody. Probably not. But Moses is every single one of us in this room. Every single one of us has messed up. Every single one of us has done something that separated us from God. Every single one of us has reached a point where we did something that we felt like was so bad that we pulled away from the people that we love. That we pulled away from the people around us. And then God asks us to do something. And what do we do? We do the exact same thing that Moses did. We look at ourselves, the current situation we're in, we look at our past and we say, but God, I can't. Or better yet, we look at it and say, God, you can't do this for me. We start to make excuses. We say, God, I did this, I did that, or they won't listen. What if they do this? What if this happens? How do I deal with this? It's, it's too much. I can't do it. Every single one of us is that person. Every single one of us is Moses. Every single one of us has reached that point in our lives where God asks us to do something or God says he wants to do something in our lives and we make excuse after excuse after excuse as to why it can't be done. The truth is God wants to restore us back to him. But we say... Our past is too much for him. So he says to us the same thing that he says to Moses. I am going to do the work for you. I am going to do all of these things. We say, I don't deserve it. And we try to walk away. All because we think we know what God can do. We think we know what God is capable of. C.S. Lewis said it this way. If God forgives us, we must forgive ourselves. Otherwise, it's almost like setting ourselves up as a higher tribunal than him. Think about that for a second. If we truly are humble, and we truly approach life with true humility, understanding, again, the definition of humility, understanding who we are in relation to God. If we truly approach our lives and our sin out of humility, this doesn't happen. But when we approach life with a false humility, then when God says, I can forgive that and start over and use you in ways that you can't believe. If we refuse to forgive ourselves, then we're setting ourselves up as a higher tribunal than God himself.
Think about it. How many times do we do something that we say, God can't forgive that? How many times do we watch somebody do something and we say, there's no way God can forgive that? How many, people in our, how many times in our lives have we walked away because we felt like God can't forgive that? How many times have we, and I'm talking all of us, whether you're watching at home, whether you're in the room, how many times have we done something to hurt somebody and said, I can't go back to that relationship because it is too damaged? We said it right off the bat with this series. With man, it's impossible, but with God, nothing is impossible. Everything is possible. Only God can forgive the things that we do and the things that we say is, are, are unforgivable. But when we say, God, you, it's, it's too much. I, I, don't, I don't deserve it. I refuse it. Then you are making yourself God. And when you make yourself out to be God, all you do is drive a larger wedge. At some point, we have to let go we have to let go and realize that God is not handicapped by our past. God is not handicapped by the things that we did in the past. In fact, God will take those things that we did in the past and show where he restored us and do something unbelievable through it. That's why we share our stories. That's why when Jesus healed the, the, the demon-possessed man, the demon-possessed man, I talked about this with the youth yesterday morning. The, when, as soon as all that was over and Jesus was about to leave, he went to Jesus and he said, I want to come with you. I want to go where you're going. I want to be with you. And Jesus said, well, okay, that's all well and good, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back to your loved ones and your family. I want you to go back where you were to the people that, you, that, that probably abandoned you because of what you have done and who you became. But I want you to go back to them and I want you to tell them about the mercy and grace that was shown to you today. See, God restores us so that we can share our stories, so that people can see when we've gone so far out into left field that it comes back. See, God isn't handicapped by our, our, our past because he is gracious. There's nothing that we can do to get that forgiveness. He gives it to us on its own. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, it says, for, grace, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one can boast. If it was up to us, God would get no glory from anything. But because God can take us and he can, he can put grace out of there and he can use grace in our life to pull us back into him, it changes the world. Fighting the idea of, of salvation because we think we don't deserve it gets us nowhere. Because God isn't handicapped by our past. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. It is a gift. It is, it is a, an exercise in grace. We, in order, we have got to change our thought processes. We've got to change our, processes, our thought processes from God can't do this to understand the fact that he did already do it and is inviting us to step into something that he's already done the heavy lifting for. He's already given us this gift of salvation. He's already given us the gift of forgiveness. All we have to do is reach out and take it. We never fully experience what the grace of God is like because we keep running. Every time we look up, we run because we feel like it's too extravagant. None of us would ever look at somebody who genuinely came to us and said, Hey, look, I have... $10,000 cash right here for you. Once they convince you that it's free and it's yours, you take it. You take it. You never look at them, no, I'm good. I know it's free. You're giving it to me. And I, I believe you, but no, nah, I'm good. None of us would do that. We would take the ten grand and run. 
But when it comes to salvation, we keep running because we believe that we will never be put together enough to deserve it. And you know what? You're right. You will never be put together enough to deserve salvation. But that's what grace is. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Restoration and salvation, they are gifts that we don't deserve from a God who loves us immeasurably. You don't have to wrap your head all the way around it. You don't have to understand it. It's just a gift. God isn't handicapped by our past, and here's why. Because he is greater than anything you will ever experience on this earth. When I say greater, I don't mean like, hey man, that's great. I'm talking scope-wise. He is greater than anything that you could ever experience. His love is deeper. His thoughts are higher. His ways are way more powerful. In fact, Scripture says that God uses the weak to confound the strong. And he uses what seems foolish to confuse the wise. That's why it doesn't make sense to us. It's not supposed to. All he asks us to do is accept a gift that he offers out of his graciousness. This whole series, we've been moving towards this idea of, of being made into what we were originally intended to be. Every single one of you needs restoration. Every single one of us. Because none of us are there yet. None of us are in that place where we are exactly who God wants us to be. So what does that mean for us then? It means that we're a work in progress. It means we're still going to make mistakes. It means we're going to fall short. But from what we've learned over the last few weeks, we are never too far from God. And that he's not handicapped by our past. And that sometimes we have to struggle in order to become who God has created us to be. But that if we will consistently repent, confess our sins, and turn away, that every single one of us, if we will let God step into our battlefield and fight for us, will become someone after God's own. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what things you're running from. I don't know what things you're running towards. All I know is that our God is greater than your circumstances. He turned water into wine. He made the blind to be able to see. He comforts the hurting. And he extends peace and grace and mercy. And if God is for you and is fighting for you, then nobody stand against you. In just a second, the band's going to come up. We're going to play one more song. And during this song, I'm going to be right down here. If you are someone who has felt like you have been running from God because you felt like you just don't deserve it, hear this. None of us deserve it. But God loves us anyway. And if that's you, Stop running. It's time. Because you'll never be able to run far enough that God won't be able to reach you. I'm going to be right down here. If you need to pray or you want someone to pray with you, I will pray with you. If you have questions, I will try to answer your questions. Father, thank you so much that you love us so much more than we could ever begin to understand. I pray that in these next few moments, God, that if there's anybody in this room or anybody watching at home online that has been running from you because of their mistakes of their past, 
I pray that this morning they will stop running. And that they will allow that gift of grace and mercy to begin the process of restoring the relationship between you and them. Father, I thank you for loving us. And I thank you for encouraging us and for restoring us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.